Hey everybody, welcome to week 10. So this is our final lecture for microbiology, and so let's just get started. We have two PowerPoints to go through, but they shouldn't take too long at all. All right, so let me just bring up our first one. So we're gonna start with the urinary tract infections. This is the larger of the two PowerPoints. Just getting it set up here. Okay, we'll go skip through objectives, anatomy, so essentially the urinary tract includes the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. There are two different types of urinary tract infections, UTIs. You need to have a lower UTI, which is going to involve the bladder and urethra, or an upper UTI, which involves the ureters and kidneys. So there's just a lovely little picture of everything where we separate the upper from the lower. Normal flora, as far as urinary tract, especially above the urethra, should be pretty much sterile. So urine is supposed to be sterile, especially if the patient has done a really good job cleansing themselves when they collect it. The times that we see contamination or normal flora contaminants is because they didn't cleanse well enough upon collection. But otherwise, urine should be a sterile source. When we collect for urine cultures, we do a quantitative culture collection. And so you guys, I believe, have been already practicing this, but essentially, you know, you're taking a calibrated loop and streaking once down the center and then back and forth. And the reason we do that is so that we can come up with a number of colonies. And that number of colonies helps us determine are these just contaminants? Is this a colonization that maybe will turn into something later, or is it really an infection? So that's why we always use a quantitative calibrated loop to come up with colony counts to help us separate what's really causing the disease infection and what's just contamination. So some normal flora that you'll see show up as contamination. Some of these are very familiar to us at this point as normal flora of the skin and all that. Coagnate staph, especially staph epidermis. The one that we would not include here as contamination is staph saprophyticus. We would definitely want to take staph saprophyticus seriously if it showed up in a UTI, um, in a urine culture, because it's well known to cause UTIs. Lactobacillus, um, diphtheroids, again, those cranibacterium diphtheroids, and then other types of stress that are more non-hemolytic or alpha-hemolytic viridin. For as far as UTIs go, again, so many different things can cause UTIs. There's just a long list. The number one cause of UTIs is E. coli. Otherwise, you get all of your other Enterobacteriaceae here, your Klebsiella within that as well, Staph saprophyticus, especially in women, your Enterococci, that one causes a lot of nosocomial UTIs. Enterococci, remember, goes a lot with nosocomial infections, so that does cause some nosocomial-based UTIs, and then Pseudomonas as well. But E. coli overall is the number one cause. Um, so again, same kind of list, whether you acquired in the community or whether you acquired in the hospital. Okay, types of infections other than UTIs, you have urethritis, which is an infection of the urethra. This is always due to an STD. So you have chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomonas vaginalis there. Cystitis, again, was that lower UTI, so infection of the bladder, if you will. So you see dysuria, frequency, urgency. Um, cleanliness to the urine indicating the bacterial growth. And so again, we've already talked through the different guys that can cause different UTIs here, so we didn't mention them there. Acute urethral syndrome, again, is due with sexually active women more. Pyelonephritis was the upper UTI. This one is a little bit more severe for pain and fever. Um, and it's involving the kidney, so it's a bit more severe of an infection. All right, as far as specimens go, any type of urine sample is great. Um, if typically, clean catch is probably the easiest one to get. It's the most common one to get. The goal with the clean catch midstream, though, is really good cleansing. So really giving nice, clear instructions to the patient on the proper technique on how to clean so that hopefully we get a good sample. A lot of times we'll get it in and it's filled with epithelial cells and it's filled with different types of bacteria, so it's just a crappy sample that's not gonna do much for us. So really good instructions to the patient is ideal. Yeah, you can give good instructions, and sometimes they still don't get it, but you do your best as you can. 
Catheterized urine is great, especially if they've done a proper job catheterizing it. They should not have any contamination. There should be a nice, clean sample with just the pathogen growing. The best sample to get would be a suprapubic bladder aspiration in which you directly draw urine out of the bladder with a syringe. This should be completely contamination free as long as they did it sterile. Um, and of course, the physician is doing this, not us. And this is pretty extreme. We wouldn't go to this method. Really, we would do more of the clean catch or catheterized if we really needed something. But um, there is a very nice contamination free method with the super pubic. Indwelling catheter, this definitely makes sure you have an aseptic technique again. Um, and again, with catheterized urine, we're not taking the urine out of the bag. Please, no, that's. Um, that bag has been sitting there growing bacteria like crazy, so it's not out of the bag. And then when we get the urine sample, we are ideally getting it right away. We don't want it sitting on a countertop somewhere just sitting there because the longer it sits on a counter, the more the bacteria can multiply unless it has a preservative added to it. If it's got a preservative added to it, then it can sit for a little bit, but otherwise, ideally, we get it right away and we refrigerate it until we can work it up. For urine cultures, you know, when we go to plate these, we're gonna first make sure the urine is mixed really thoroughly because the bacteria and other stuff will tend to settle to the bottom, so we wanna make sure that's nice and swirled. And then you would dip your calibrated loop in, so you're usually using a 0.01 or a 0.001 calibrated loop. So if you use a 0.01, the next day when you count the colonies, you're timesing it by 100. The one is out to the hundredth place. If you're using the 0 .001 and the next day you're counting the colonies, you're timesing it by 1,000 because the one is to the thousandth place. I'm most familiar with the thousand one, but there definitely is the 0 .01 loop as well. So ideally, we're playing to blood auger and the conchi auger for sure because blood will grow pretty much everything. The conch will grow ground egg rods and give us the fermentation characteristics. Some labs also like to add on a grand pause plate, like a CNA or a PEA, and that's definitely good. That's definitely okay. So you might do two or you might do three plates, just depending on the lab. So again, making sure your sample is well mixed. You dip your in, um, calibrate loop into the urine and then streak down once down the center and then back and forth as much as you can, throw it in the incubator. And when you get it the next day, you're gonna do a colony count on these. So remember, we all know now that different bacteria show up as different colonies on the agar plates. Some are small colonies with hemolysis, some are big colonies, no hemolysis and gray. Some are white, some are have a metallic sheen. You get the idea, you all know that there's definitely different colony morphology types out there. So what we do is we count the different types we have and the amounts we see of them. So if you have small grays, let's count how many small gray colonies you see. So if you see 10 small gray colonies, you again would, oops, sorry, no, oh, wrong way, multiply it by the loop calibrator you have. So if you use 1,000 and you had 10 small grays, you would have 10,000 small grays then, because 10 times 1,000. And then if you had medium whites with a beta hemolysis, you would count those and say you had 50, then you'd have 50,000 um, medium white beta hemolytic. And so out of those two, knowing that number helps you determine what's the pathogen, what's the contaminant. So 10,000 versus 50,000 should be obvious. 50,000, definite pathogen, definitely something that's causing an infection. That's a lot of bacteria. 10,000? And it's probably just contamination. You know, it's nothing that I we would be to worry about. So every lab is going to have different policies and what they will work up with numbers and what they won't. Some of it's gonna be common sense. Some of it will actually have a policy like, we don't work up anything more than three colony types because if it has more than three colony types, that's all contamination. Unless you see one that's really predominant. If you see one colony, that's like 100,000, you definitely should work that one up. That's the bad boy of them all. So you kind of use the policy slash common sense on this. So again, we start in the incubator, read it the next day, quantitate each colony type. And so here's an example of how they would determine if they work something up or if they don't. So again, every hospital lab is a little bit different. 
So just so you know, the CCMS stands for clean catch midstream urine. So on this case, they're saying greater than 10,000 of a single pathogen or for each of two pathogens. That's probably greater than 100,000. I don't know my exponents. I'm really bad at math, if you ever didn't know that. I suck at math. Um, greater than 100,000 would definitely completely work it up. The next line is saying greater than 10,000 of one pathogen and nothing else grew, then they said, yeah, work it up. We know it's a low number, but it was the only thing that was there. No other colony types are there, so it was a pure sample telling us it was a good collection. They said, yep, let's still work it up. In the next line down, they said they had three organism types with no predominating organism, none, probable contamination. They would reject that and then ask the physician for a new sample potentially if they still wanted to go ahead. The next line says either two or three organism types of predominant growth of one, Complete the workup for just a predominant organism, ignore the other couple that were low numbers. So you can see how this is just a great example of knowing the number, the quantity of the different colonies, what you would consider pathogenic, what would be just contamination. So again, it's going by your hospital policy and it's going a little bit by common sense. The last one was done on a superpubic. Anything that grows on a superpubic should usually be worked up. That's the one with the needle into a bladder. It should be completely contamination free. So here's another chart that I found online. Um, I like this one better. I feel like this one's a bit more clear, but this one you can also look at. These are not ones I'm going to test you on, but I want, you'll get tested on a question maybe that will ask, give you a number and would you work it up or not. But I don't expect you to memorize this. This is just to give you examples of how they view if it's infection or contamination. So there's just two examples of the blood auger and the macaque auger. When they get really thick like this, you obviously have one organism that's really predominant and it looks to be a gram neg rod, right? Because it's growing all over the blood auger and it's heavily grown on the macaque auger. It looks like a lactose fermenter gram neg rod. And then they're showing letter B here though, is there is a small second colony type in there. Now you'd have to really look amongst these other ones to see them, but I would say B, if it was in small numbers, would just be contaminants, and that A is your main bad boy here. All right, so that's it on UTIs. Um, just knowing a little bit difference between the upper versus lower UTI, knowing uh, when we would work something up or not, that kind of thing. That's all you really need to take away from here. And then our next part point is going to be genital tract infections. All right, so normal flora in the genital tract, again, very similar here. Coagnate stuff, cranibacterium diphthoroids, grandpa's rod like bacillus. Um, cranibacterium is also grandpa's rod. And some anaerobes might be found here, lactobacillus, and some other types of streps. So you can see very similar list to the urinary normal flora. STDs are a big thing here with the genital tract infection. So we have chlamydia, gonorrhea, trichomonas vaginalis. Treponema pallidum, remember that's the cause of syphilis. And then urea plasma, urea lyticum, and mycoplasma hominis. We had a very short chapter on these two. Remember, these two are cell wall deficient bacteria, and these were found causing genital urinary tract kind of problems. Um, so that was a really brief mention in that chapter on them. Herpes virus, HIV virus, and the human papilloma virus, all, of course, STDs. Now, there are some other things listed here that you're probably looking through is list going, these look like intestinal type of infections. And they can be, but we consider them because they can also be passed sexually to another person if you have this. So remember, STDs, we commonly think chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, but any, if anything is passed through a sexual transmission, it can be under the category STD. So yeah, you can pass Giardia to somebody else if you have it. You can pass Shigella potentially to somebody else. So these are grouped here because if they're passed that way, they can technically be considered an STD then. Symptoms of STDs, dysuria, some sort of discharge. Um, a lot of times, scary enough, they're asymptomatic, especially um, men. Men tend to have less symptoms than women. And so it is kind of scary that way, thinking of how many could be out there and people don't get tested. 
If you have syphilis or um, Haemophilus ducreyi, which we didn't mention here, but Haemophilus ducreyi, I remember, is an STD, both present with a chancre, that lesion on the genital area. Other types of lesions that are not considered the chancre but are different, you have your herpes, and then you have your papilloma, which are warts. Those are two different types of things. Um, vaginitis, which is an inflammation of the vagina, and then cervicitis, inflammation of the cervix. Auger plates, blood auger, of course, because of almost everything. Chocolate is a big one because Neisseria and Haemophilus, both are possible pathogens here. And then if we are screening for Neisseria, modified Sarah Martin, Martin Lewis, or even NYC, which we've never really talked about, all those will grow Neisseria gonorrhea. DNA agar can be set up here in case maybe it's more of a yeast infection. That will grow yeast really well. Um, so that can maybe be thought of being set up. Most of the time with genital type stuff, we're not really growing the stuff out. We are usually getting swabs in and doing molecular and PCR testing. Most of the time, chlamydia gonorrhea is run on one swab together to screen for it. We usually, we can't grow chlamydia out. We can grow nectaria out on a chocolate agar, but Typically, it's a lot of PCR testing. In the case of herpes and HIV, those are all blood tests to look for antibodies. So not as much auger-based stuff here in the micro lab. It's more other types of testing. All right, so that is it. Um, this is our final regular lecture. Next week, we will do the final exam review. Check the calendar in the course. I'll also have an announcement coming up this weekend on when it will be occurring so that you can attend. Otherwise, of course, I always record it. If you need anything, as always, give me a holler. Thanks.